Welcome back to Grit Gym, guys. We have Elias Notus here. He's from flavorhacker.com. And we're going to talk about building your own healthy lifestyle and getting to the point in your life where uh, or how the, the path that he took to figure out what he wants to do with his life and what may, has meaning to him. And Elias, can you kind of introduce yourself to the Grit Gym tribe and tell them uh, a little bit about you? Yeah, what's up, Grit Gym? Uh, I'm Elias. Um, I'm, I'm building a brand right now that I'm super excited about called Flavor Hacker. Um, and it's uh, it's largely one of those projects where you like kind of build it because you're scratching your own itch. Yeah, you know what I mean, I always had this this sort of dysfunctional relationship with food when I got to adulthood. When I got out into the real world and I could kind of choose my own my own dishes, right? And I I got you know super <laughs> super addicted to all this stuff that's not really good for you unless you're trying to be a yeah. sumo wrestler, right? So put on a lot of weight in my twenties and uh, too. Yeah. yeah, right, <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, so I, my my path to back to fitness because I was really athletic as a as a teenager. I was a mm -hmm. pretty high level competitive martial artist and could never put on weight at all because I was always burning off more than I was consuming on a daily yeah. basis. It's and a nice then when that out. right, yeah, and yeah. then I just thought I was like, oh, I have a fast metabolism. No, I just was working all the time. You know right. what I mean? So, um, yeah, and I just kind of realized at a certain point after a lot of like ninety day challenges, you know, I'd get in, in crazy condition I'd get super ripped and then I'd go back to eating my normal food and I'd get fat again either slowly or or uh, or quite quickly depending on the on the speed of things so and it, I finally was like dude I have to find stuff that that I actually enjoy eating that I would eat if I weren't on a diet or if I weren't trying to be healthy per se right yep. if I can find those foods that make me happy and like feed your soul feed your happiness that you can share with with family and friends and loved ones then that's the cornerstone for that balanced lifestyle for me, right? And yeah. I think that's what's missing for a lot of people. So I couldn't agree more. Yeah, yeah. Um, th there's just no use in being miserable through the whole process of of eating well. You know, yeah, it no doesn't way. have to taste like crap. Yeah, and I have I have some friends. You know, Las Vegas has a pretty active uh, bodybuilding and fitness model community here, and, and it's 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 a healthy city, quote air quotes, healthy city, but on the cosmetic end of healthy, if that makes sense, right? Sure. So you see a lot of like really really pretty people at the gym. Amazing physique, really good, good condition, um, and some of my my gym friends. I'm like, you can't possibly be happy eating that. Yeah. And they'll, they'll they'll post on their Instagram account. They're like, I have all my food prepped for the whole week, and it's like twelve identical boxes of chicken and steamed broccoli. I'm doing you're driving me nuts. Seriously, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just has to be so boring that it's insane. I yeah. I, 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 I can't imagine just. Uh, uh, well, I can because I did it. But it's just like right, at yeah. some point you have to just uh, adjust and be like, "Am I actually enjoying this? Like, this is a huge part of my life, for and sure, I, and I'm getting nothing out of it. Like, does it need to be this way?" Yeah, I, th I think no, that's kind it, of it story is helping people to not have to do that, for sure. Yeah. And uh, you know, my background is really unique. I've I've got about twenty. 25 years into uh, a restaurant career now. And mm -hmm. I, I went away from it for a short time, came back to it, but I've done everything. Then I started as kitchen help when I was in high school at like literally at the, like the little family run deli that was next door to my, my karate uh, dojo. Right. So I'd go okay. there and I'd work out in the morning and oh, I'd nice. go and I'd work, work a few hours for their lunch rush and like break down chickens so, and chop up vegetables and stuff. And that was the first time I'd ever did anything in a kitchen I'd go back and do more workouts in the afternoon. But, uh, you know, and that later I, I got into the fine dining world and I gravitated towards wine. So I worked as a sommelier for years and um, been very fortunate. You know, Las Vegas is a great area to do or a city to do wine in because some people come in here and they quite literally have, you know, play money to that the casino gives them to <laughs> if they gamble enough money. Right. They get to get pretty much whatever they want. So, you know, me selling uh, wines in the thousand to ten thousand dollar range is not like something that happens once a year. It's you know, it happens quite a bit. So it's it's a fun environment wow. to sell wine. In. That's crazy. I didn't know yeah, that. that happened. Was, yeah, it's cool. Um, and uh, but I also have been very fortunate. I've worked in four different Michelin starred restaurants, uh, one two star, one three star Michelin restaurant, and right. to see the stuff behind the scenes when when. You know, you talked about earlier when we were offline, um, food is a, is a hedonic pleasure, like something that really like yeah. there is like just a soulful, purely enjoyment uh, based uh, experience with food that we can have. Well, then we yeah. get into the restaurants at that level. You're talking about food as art, right? right. Food as a concept, as. Um, and, and even there, you're talking about like art is in like in terms of beauty and that like uh, when you start analyzing like 
like what is pleasing to us and like is there anything better than that you know like like or yeah. more important than that like i don't know yeah and, for sure and uh, like so at that level like you you luckily i worked with chefs who they're, they're like number one thing like the, the food still has to taste amazing it still has to taste good not experimental so there was always that balance right so even though we did experimental yeah. stuff the food was still delicious by by dictate from the chef um but I realized some of those dishes I was tasting, I was like, dude, this barely has any caloric load in it at all. And it's delicious. Yeah. And I would eat this happily anytime, right? And I realized yeah. that, like, that calories don't always mean flavor. Sometimes they, right. they do correlate, right? Like you put, oh, a bunch sure. of, put a bunch of fat in something. I mean, of course, it's going to taste great, right? But you, I mean, so I love fatty dense. Stuff. Yeah, me too, dude. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's amazing. And so, yeah, actually, um, I... I've always loved to cook, right? But me in the past was like, it was just like idiot level uh, stuff. At least you're, if you're trying to pay attention to your waistline, like I would find some recipe or some dish and I'd be like, oh, how can I make this the most retarded, over the top, <laughs> you know, hedonistic sort of version of this, right? So, yeah. uh, you know, I'd end up with like putting 50% more extra calories in it, you know, because I'd yeah. add pork belly to it or this or that or whatever, right? And it was fun, right? It's, and it's great and it's fun to show pictures and, and brag about yeah. like this amazing dinner you had. And it was actually a, a friend of mine uh, who's a chef uh, at a different restaurant. I met him for a couple of drinks after work when I was living in New York City, and he kind of called me out. He's like, "He's like, dude, I've seen I've seen your your pictures. Like, it's like you can make a game of like how many calories can you throw at a dish, right? And like, I get it. It's like challenge food. It's fun, but like, you also have this desire to be a healthy, athletic individual. Like, why not just change the game? Why not? Why not just? <clears throat> why not just?" Make the game like, ooh, how can I make this still taste like a pizza or a cheeseburger or a lasagna, whatever it is that you're jonesing for on a flavor, strictly, you know, enjoyment flavor way wise. And then it's like, but make that a healthy or healthy ish version of right. that thing so that your brain says, ooh, hamburger or ooh, pizza. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm sating that craving that I have for that quote bad food. But then when mm -hmm. you really break down the macros and the calories, you're like, dude, that wasn't bad. I mean, that was honestly like, right. Two chicken breasts, potato, and some broccoli. Yeah. That's the same thing. So, like, I enjoyed this a yeah. lot more on this side, and it's just as clean. It's just got a ton of flavor, right? So, why not do it if and you then have you it? Satisfied. Yeah, you you get to that that satisfied portion of of what you were trying to get in the first place because, like, from eating, you know, you, you wanted sure. something. Uh, you wanted to get something from eating that thing. You wanted an experience. So, give yourself the experience with having to like like fill yourself up for sure. Uh, in yeah. The process. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's a really important uh, cornerstone of, of satisfaction with food. And obviously, like, yeah. I think as we as Americans, we can probably admit uh, that we, <laughs> we love really big portions, right? And so I think if you train your belly on really big portions, then sometimes right. if you eat what other other people from like the UK or Spain or something would consider like a, a decent portion for a meal or, or a dish. And like your American belly is kind of like, well, okay, where's the food? That was cool for a warm up. But like, where, <laughs> where are we going from here, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So <laughs> part of that is, you know what I mean? So part of that is, part of that is like sheer volume of food. And you can do that with like lots of vegetables and salads and stuff like that. You make that a cornerstone of, of a meal. Then like overall in total, you still feel full. But then if you right. don't give yourself that little nugget or that, that plate yep. of something that just, like, you just love eating because you love eating it. Like right. that's the other part of satisfaction right there. Yeah. Yeah. You don't like, that's one strategy. You just try to have a, like, micronutrient dense food instead of macronutrient dense food right uh For sure yeah but if it but if you just ate a bunch of micronutrient dense food and you're just like i got no satisfaction off that you're still going to go in search of other things and totally you want to you want to get both of those at the same time so you want like food that like satisfies the 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 taste craving and the and the experience that you want but also that like nurtures your body and and satisfies the uh, all the other things that you're eating the food for right uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, and, and I think you're right about like the pleasure thing. Like, it's like spiritual, but it's also like primitive, and it's also like necessary for life. Right? Yeah. I mean, like nature did some pretty cool things. It said, uh, "You, you, you're gonna." It, it, it made the the greatest pleasures also, or the the things that you needed to survive. It made them your greatest pleasures. It's like, yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah. Um, and going back to what you said about micronutrient density, that was actually the, one of the one of the light bulb moments that I had in my own thinking with this um, was that you know you, it's it's a pretty often talked about um, concept in the in the health and fitness world is like micro, micronutrient density per calorie you know of the foods yeah. right 
Um, and I was like, well, no one's talking about like flavor density. If you could have a unit yeah. of flavor, you really can't unless I make this shit up, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> good point. You know, I probably will at some point. It's like, call it flavor units, F you. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, how much, how many, how many flavor units per calorie can you, can you cram in a dish, right? Yeah. No one's talking about that, right? And, yeah. you know, certain things don't cost you anything, like fresh herbs, uh, you know, ginger, garlic, cilantro, lemongrass, uh, you know, basil, all these things, they cost you absolutely no calories whatsoever. Salt, yeah. pepper, these things. Chilies are amazing. I don't know if you like spicy food. I love um, spicy food. Um, yeah. I, what Rach I, considers spicy is like two different things, but, but yeah, I really like spicy food. Right. Yeah, I do as well. And like, uh, and I can geek out for, you know, 30 minutes. We'll do that another time about like <laughs> chili peppers and how amazing they are. And like, they, you know, what, what was Indian food or Thai food, you know, before chilies came from the new world, had to go all the way <laughs> through Europe. The Europeans are like, dude, yeah. I don't like this. It makes my mouth feel weird. Right. Then I went through, down through Africa and across through Asia. And now like you look at uh, cuisines that are notably spicy like that. Like what did, what did that food look like before the 1600s? Right. Yeah. Um, it's fascinating yeah. on a human cultural level, but like chilies go back yeah. to chilies. Those cost you no calories at all. And that adds a ton of flavor to food, uh, to food. And, and, yeah. and, and it can be balanced as well. You don't have to like smack yourself in the, in the right. time with a, a heat hammer, right? It can actually just yeah. be like, that's one of the most annoying things about spicy food to me is, is when it's so hot that it's not funny, that it doesn't taste good. It's like, ah, oh, yeah. you lost me. But yeah. before that, it's amazing. Yeah. No, I, I used to uh, I used to do the stupid like chili challenge stuff with my friends because I grew up in California had and grew up eating really spicy uh, Mexican food and whatnot as well. Sure. But uh, there's there's an Indian restaurant here in in Las Vegas that they they have a a ghost chili menu where every every course is a taste man tasting uh, menu. Every course course has ghost chilies in it, which are like over a million scovilles and heat units, right? Yeah. And uh, they make you sign a waiver, like a liability waiver, sure. before you eat the food. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably because you're going to be so mad at them like as soon as you eat it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's pretty funny. Yeah. No, that's the stuff that I just that I like. Uh, you can, if it's going to ruin my day, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good, right? Yeah, I've For done sure. that kind of stuff before. No. But, um, so like, like kind of what was the, like what was the impetus that got you here? Like what was the, uh, like, like you were in martial arts and you were, you were in the, the restaurant industry. Um, like what were, like the steps since, uh, like what got you out of restaurant and then what got you back into food again? Well, I mean, my path has always been kind of, you know, <laughs> marching to the path of a, of a different uh, drummer, you know what I mean? So um, sure. I never really wanted the well, traditional. If, if you were normal, normal I wouldn't have invited you on the show, so. Exactly, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> So for me, you know, I, I studied music in college. I studied opera uh, at Florida State University. Yeah. There's a huge, uh, really awesome music school there. And you know, I went, I left, uh, I left Florida State, uh, went to Manhattan and studied voice with a couple of prominent voice teachers when I was in my early to mid twenties. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and no one really knew what to do with my voice because it ended up being like a dramatic bass baritone, dramatic bass uh, type of voice, and it matures later. It's really hard to find roles that are not going to kill you as a 25 year old when you're that old. So I kind of just okay. gravitated away from it. Sure. But that was also the, the first time that I got really fat. Um, <laughs> and uh, actually, the only time I got really fat. Let's be honest, because I got up to a, <laughs> I got up to a certain point. And the funny thing is, I, I justified it in my head because this goes back to, to self image, right? If you view yourself as I'm a big boned individual, it's going to be hard for that person to lose weight. And stay there unless they they re self identify with a different yeah because uh, they body think that's type. who they are not they, they yeah. think of fat as something that they are it's a part of their identity instead of just something that they have you know like like you don't say that totally. you are fingernails you are you have fingernails exactly yeah so with fat, for some reason we do it different for sure absolutely and I, I had always you know I'd grown up you know painfully thin in my in my uh, teenage years because I was just burning off more calories than I could yeah. ever take in you know because I was yeah. in I was in the dojo for like you know five six hours a day six days a week and I would have been in there on the seventh except they were closed on Sundays right because <laughs> I'm just an idiot like that so yeah. um I understand and then when I got off and I got off and I kind of got away from the daily exercise thing and I was I was studying opera and like I I remember hearing an interview with Pavarotti it was like He's like, oh, you need to have big girth to, uh, to you know, have a big voice. I was like, all right, I need to be a big, big person, right? So I just started, sure. you know, using that as an excuse to pretty much eat everything in sight. And, like, <laughs> you can find some good food in Manhattan as well. So, you I know, um, 
yeah, so I, I it's kind of funny. I, I remember writing this down uh, last year. I was kind of writing, doing some some writing on a book, and and, and it, it's amazing how introspective you get trying to put this down on paper, stuff that you maybe you've thought oh, about, yeah. but you haven't really analyzed it yourself. Right. And I remember one time, uh, two times with the scale. I've never had like a weird scale relationship, but I didn't. I purposely didn't have a bathroom scale during that kind of fat, yeah. you know, couple of years, right? And um, I was joking around with a friend of mine, and uh, and she's like, "Well, how much do you weigh?" I was like, "Oh, I'm probably around 250, right? I'm six four. Like 250 is not good for my frame because I have like I don't have a really big, huge bone structure. So 250 is way too fat already. And I knew that, but I was like, oh, I'm probably 250." I step on the scale and I and I was 269. And I was like really? mortified. Wow, I was mortified, dude. And I yeah. looked down at the scale and I remember making some jokes. We'd had dinner earlier. I was like, "Oh, they must have had a lot of heavy metals in that Chinese food, you know, and the, and the <laughs> fish that we had, right?" And like kind of playing it off, but inside I was a little bit hurt, right? I'm looking at the scale. I'm like, "Dude, what did you do?" Yeah. And uh, and you know, I don't even know how what did, my head was that. Come to this, yeah. Right, exactly. And that was a weird. It was a weird smack in the face from from uh, mm -hmm. you know numbers, and uh, I. Uh, I also kind of thought about it later. I was like, dude, if I, I haven't stepped on a scale this calendar year, I'm mean, like, how? What was my true heaviest? Like 269, which is just the biggest number I happen to see because I was choosing right. not to track it on purpose. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, and so, at that weight, you could fluctuate, you know, 10, 12 pounds a day. Probably oh yeah, easy. it's insane. Yeah. yeah. And so that was kind of like my wake up call. Of course, I was not on a diet the next day, but you know, within the next month, I was like, all right, I need to get this under control. So. Right. And I was also living apart from my family, and I, I realized that I kind of developed this. Definitely unhealthy relationship with my with my weight because I still saw myself as that really young, athletic, live mm -hmm. individual. Um, yeah. But I felt the need to like be a big, strong guy too. So it's kind of caught yeah. between two different two different things. And I neither one was really like, serving. If you're like, a dude. I think you've been there. At some point. Yeah, of <laughs> yeah. course. Yeah, like yeah. whether you're whether you're five five or six four, like you always right. like at some point you're in your like early twenties or late teens. You're like, oh, I want to get big. I want to get strong. Whatever. Yeah. We, we all go through yeah. that thing. Um, <laughs> And uh, but I was living away from my family. Was still back in California. But I, you know, this is before the days of FaceTime and stuff. So no one's seen me, right? And I'm like, oh, true, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Didn't have anybody to give you a reality check, right? And yeah. you don't. You also can't see how fat someone's getting over the phone, right? So, so, and I just all of a sudden I felt really embarrassed. And that's when I like started getting into like, dude, every stupid fad, crash diet, cabbage soup diet, <laughs> you name it, you name it. I've tried every scammy sort of thing, and you know, and and let me be clear, diets work 100% of the time. It's what you do after the diet does not work, right? right? And yeah, so, exactly. Everything works for six to 12 weeks. It's absolutely, it's when yeah. You go back to your regular lifestyle. The, the regular lifestyle is what got you where yeah. you were. Like, it, so. Um, and at that point, the, yeah. the, the band's pulled so tight when you let it go, it's, it snaps back so hard, dude. But yeah, I right. remember going on this, in this stupid crash diet before I went home for Christmas one year because I was just, and I still showed up at like 245, but I was just like, I was embarrassed of myself, right? So I did, sure. and that's why I got in this weird thing of like crash diets and in and out of that, whatever. Yeah. And uh, I think I, over the course of, it's a long time ago, so I don't really remember, but it was a little bit over a year. I, I got from that 269, 270 area down to 185. And so, oh, wow. that's a, yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a lot. Change. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. lot. Yeah. And I also like hadn't been doing any resistance training for years before that point. So I probably put on a little bit of muscle at some point, you know, even if it's only five pounds, I don't know what that was, but certainly got a lot stronger in that time. <clears throat> but going back to the scale thing is we all can have our own issues. I think yeah. females more than males with, with scale issues. Yeah. Totally. It, but I did get a bathroom scale. Like, yes. Yeah, yeah, totally. Right. And, uh, yeah. and, um, so I, I got a bathroom scale and I would track and I would track and I would track. Um, and made a bunch of uh, progress, and I was, I was, you know, I was feeling energetic. I was really happy about the stuff, dude. I yeah. stepped on the scale one morning, and it read one ninety nine, and I about had a freaking panic attack because then you go back like, to self identity, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. you go back to self identity, and I'm like, oh, I'm a big strong guy, and I was like, I have to be over two hundred if I'm going to be a big strong guy, right? It's, it's right. a number. It doesn't mean especially anything. at six four. Like, like some people hear two hundred pounds, and they're like, oh my gosh, that's huge. At six four, that's a fairly yeah. thin. Exactly. That wasn't yeah, pretty, like, I was pretty good. It doesn't take much, right? Yeah. Is yeah. And so down at my belly, I literally, I couldn't deal with it. I took, I took a good like three or four weeks off the diet. Cause I just like, yeah. I had this like, just like short circuit in my head. I was like, all right, what do I really want? And I was like, all right, I set out on this path and I've made a, a ton of progress, but I've still got a little bit of flab on my, on my lower abs. I'm only get down and get to like really good, really good yeah. shape just for my own edification. 
Yeah. So after a little bit of a diet break, which strategically ends up being, we're finding research now that diet breaks are actually a great long term right. strategy, right? You, um, so I did an accidental. Yeah, you almost diet have break. to have, and it's almost silly not to. Um, like yeah. science and logic are playing in, in, in tandem there. Usually that's For a sure. good sign. <laughs> For sure. And I, I leveled out at 185, and that was like for my, for my muscle uh, at the time, that was where I needed to be to like to show really lean, right? Yeah. And I lived that way for a while. And then, of course, life happens. And, yeah. and you know, I, I did this dance for years after that of, especially when I got really involved in the, in the fine dining world, uh, I, I chose to go away from music because no one really knew what to do with my voice at that point. So I got involved in the restaurant world and got involved in wine. I was working in, at, you know, some really amazing restaurants. And again, like then food becomes not only pleasure, but it becomes adventure. Like I've never had this dish. I've heard, I've read about this. I've never had it. Let's do it. And then a taste becomes a dish, which becomes a right. repeat, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so totally. 230, 235 was always like my bounce point where like, if I would let myself go for a while, I'd go up to about 235. And yep. I don't know if it was psychological or physical, but that's where I kind of settled in. And then I'd be like, all right, it's time to lean out again. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I did this, I did this dance for years before I finally kind of just decided that, that I wanted to live a different way. Right. Yeah. So anyway, long story here, this story to get back around to, um, when I got, you know, in really great shape in my forties was I had, uh, had a really good friend and colleague die, uh, completely unexpectedly. And he was way younger than I was. So it makes you kind of reevaluate like what you're doing with your life and I bet. a couple of glasses of wine and, and a lot of talking with, with friends about like, what do you want to do? So yeah. Um, I knew that as an instrument, I had a, a world-class instrument as a singer, but I had never expressed that part of my life. And so I was like, all right, I, I contacted some people that I had worked with or that I were in my circle back in the day, went out for an evaluation when I still was working uh, in Las Vegas. And, you know, the consensus of a couple of different people is like, look, you can, you can take this as, as far as you choose to take it, right? Sure. And yeah. so, but I was a little bit older, so I was like, like ah, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta do everything right, you know, because I can't be the wunderkind that's like all of a sudden the big story about like the hot up and coming kid, right? So, you know, I went yeah, back you and can't I worked the Cinderella story, yeah, totally, yeah. You're you're like almost like the phoenix coming out of the fire story, right? <laughs> so, so Still a good one. And for you know, at that time, I was like late thirties, um, and just about to turn forty, and I was like, and it's not too old for my voice type. But it's definitely, like you said, not the Cinderella story. So mm -hmm. um, I left my my career midstream. I was making really good money. I was happy doing what I was doing, but not really like yeah. that kind of deep fulfillment level. Sure. Moved to Manhattan. Was working for literally for peanuts when I first moved back. I mean, it was it was horrible. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, it, yeah, bad place to be living for peanuts. Oh, dude, it's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. One, one of the rooms, I, I mean, like, I've got a pretty big wingspan, but I literally on one axis could almost touch both walls in my bedroom at the same time on the short axis. Yeah. It was like a prison cell. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. I think the prison standards are actually slightly higher than that room. Um, but, uh, you know, as a marketing strategy for a singer, like the, mar the opera world's a kind of a funny place because um, it's becoming much more... Uh, photogenic and like there's high definition broadcast. So like being, being a, a relatively attractive person on stage and, and a good figure yeah. is now more important than ever. Cause if you're in a 4,000 sure. seat auditorium and it's not broadcast from 30 rows back, you can't tell if the person's, you know, 10% body fat or 30. It's just right. like, it is what it is in a costume. Right. Yeah. But yeah. you also have, you know, these, these stage directors is like, it's like, Oh, it'd be so hot if we could have so-and-so take his shirt off at this dramatic moment. And like, of course, and then if you're jacked, like everyone's like, oh my God, he's an opera singer and he's in really good shape, right? So you have Big that fun. little bit of marketing right. advantage, right? Yeah. And so I had very much like a, a kind of a shallow outside motivation for getting in really good shape, but that was my motivation. Yeah. And so um, I'd actually come back to Las Vegas to save up money and I was moving to Germany to go work in the fest system there because they have, okay. their their theater system is, first of all, they have a, a ton of opera theaters uh, in, in the German speaking nation. So Germany, Austria, Switzerland, uh, but especially Germany. Yeah. And cool. they're almost almost like museums are considered here, where they they are privately funded, but they're also subsidized by the government as a cultural, right. you know, sort of service to their heritage, right? Okay. Yeah. And so I mean, there's yeah. a lot of opportunity. You can get hired as a house singer at a at a fest contract and work you know, a nine month season and sing a dozen roles. You know, maybe oh. six are leading, six are supporting. But the amount of 
the amount of experience you can get in a calendar year in one season is immense compared to how we run our system in the U.S. Okay. Um, well, we have a ton, cool. a ton of tra talented singers in the U.S. and very little opera productions at a high level, and they're all scratching for the same work, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I came back to Las Vegas, and I was like, all right, I'm going to get in insane shape. Um, and, you know, we had done that and was maintaining that for a long time. I had kind of gotten addicted to, like, just the fitness lifestyle in general. Like, if I didn't work out for a couple of days, I was itching to get back in the gym, right? You know that yeah. feeling. Yeah, you made um, it happen. Yeah, absolutely. But it's just part of your, your – it's like moving meditation. It's like it's, part, it's good for your soul, right? right? And, uh, yeah, long story short, you know, we all have that, that file. Stuff happens. You have to put that stuff into – I was actually coming home from the gym. It was like two o'clock in the morning. And like, uh, what's the thing, the insurance stat that they talk about, like you're likely to get into an accident, like literally it's like three blocks from your house, right? Right, yeah. Within three blocks of your house. I was literally turning off of the major street to go to, um, to my house, uh, the next intersection. Last second, this lady pulls out, she's a drunk driver, pulls out in front of me at the last second literally the only thing I can do is avoid hitting her driver's side door. And I'm in a huge, I had actually borrowed uh, my buddy Thomas's uh, truck, thank God, for for situational reasons. And I wasn't in my little tiny car. If that had been a, a very little different day for me, because she's yeah. in a huge luxury SUV. So I broadside her. And thank God I didn't hit her door because I don't know if she'd be here if I had, right? Sure, yeah. So, you know, uh I walked away, but I had an injury to my abdomen. I had like something like a, a hernial tear um, okay. in my abdomen. I had a surgery to correct that, and that was fine. Yeah. But I also had a little damage to my right vocal cord. And uh, I don't really know why it happened, whatever, but that was like one of those things. Like that, that morning that I practiced before I went to work and before I went to the gym that night, that was the last day that I, that I would sing at that level. I, but, you know, that's you don't crazy. have to. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. And that's that's the branching point. You don't even know it until until a, a later date. So I took like three months off because my my stomach hurt so bad from the injury, right? Sure. So I just took time off from singing. I didn't, you know, I knew how to sing. Like my vocal grooves were very well worked in. Um, so I took the time off from singing. But then when I came back to it, it just wasn't working. I was like, dude, what's going yeah. on? All right, whatever. It's a little bit funky when you come back to it. It's like any coordination, right? It's like yeah. a, a gymnast takes three months off of, of you know, working out and his handstands are a little clumsy coming back into it. You right. Know, and it gets be a little rusty, yeah. Yeah. And it just yeah. never got better. Like, and so it's long crazy. story short, I had this like right on the edge of the right vocal cord. There's a, a little pocket of tissue from a, from a scar basically that uh, it will fill with fluid. So if you hear me sing for the first three to five minutes, you might not know there's anything wrong with my voice, but as the the fluid in the blood comes into this area from the warming up process, which is there actually is a physical warming up process to the voice, as I sing and the vocal floor folds fill with the, the, the lymphatic fluid and whatnot in blood, that pocket of tissue actually expands because it fills with lymphatic fluid. And then all of a sudden you have two vocal folds which are weighing two different masses. You can't individually uh, pull them, right? So you pull them both or you, pull them, or you put them back, right? Okay. So you have one that's trying to vibrate at a slightly slower pitch because it weighs a little bit more right on the edge, right? And so you get this little, uh, it's like an irregularity that comes into the voice. But, huh. you know, again, that's can I sing better wild. than the average average dude? Probably. I, you know, <laughs> I can't sing at that level. I can't be on stage. And I certainly yeah. can't sing for a, a four-hour opera because, I mean, it's just like the, the stamina is just not there. Sure. So I had... Um, going back to that outside influence, like kind of that ra rather shallow, because it wasn't like, I want to be healthy, I want to be this, right. and I want to, this is my, my, my identity. I was like, no, I kind of want to gain the system. I want to look great <laughs> if I have to take my, my shirt yeah, off. Yeah, you want to give yourself every opportunity, yeah, every right. advantage. Yeah. And so, and that was gone. Like, yeah. that was my motivation, right? And thank goodness I didn't go off the deep end, which, which could have been the other path, right? I'm like, all right, I get to eat pizza. <laughs> right? Yeah, just get um, to be fat and happy. Right. Yeah, totally. And that, that was a very real possibility as well. But like I had a, a pretty, you know, a great time of introspection. And I had a, actually had a voice surgery with a, a doctor up in, uh, up in Oregon. I sought out one of the specialists in, in that surgery and like went up several times to see him and like had every expectation that it was not a hundred percent deal, but it was more likely than not that we would be able to fix that, that, that injury. But you have to be very careful. It's a complex um, yeah, I think. area. Oh, it's basically... Shoot. There's, there's a, a mucosal uh -oh. layer, which is basically. All right, guys. Uh, hopefully Elias comes back on here quick. <laughs> I can see you. Well, um, 
hopefully Elias comes back on here quick, but because uh, I want to hear more about um, what he has going on there. But what um, while I'm going here, you can follow, follow Elias on Instagram at Flavor Hacker Fitness, and he has his own Facebook uh, uh public channel that uh, is just Elias Notus. Uh, so it's E-L-I-A-S-N-O-T-U-S. And he's messaging me now. Um, but it's pretty cool stuff. I, like the other stuff that we're, we're going to talk about, if we don't get a chance to actually hop on here. Um, <laughs> sorry about those guys. Technical stuff. Oh, is he back? Are you yeah, back? Ready? You there? Yes. Yes, oh, I am. Good. Awesome. Yeah, sorry. I was I could I could still I could still hear you and see. I was like, I'm here. <laughs> I swear um, I'm here. I swear. Yeah, so yeah, so anyway, just to, to wrap up that story, um, yeah, I went up to, to Oregon. It was a year ago, August, that I had um uh, a surgery to, to try to like once and for all for all clear that that uh, injury. Yeah. And uh, you have to be really careful. I mean, like you end up like not being able to talk well I and mean, like have a really raspy voice if they mess something up, right? And that's why I wanted to go see. I, like, pay, I paid out of pocket, and the insurance wasn't covering any of this, right? I paid out of pocket to have the surgery with like one of the best people. Sure. And um, you might as well. It's it's how you make your living, so you should. Yeah, totally. And uh, and uh, so you know, I had the surgery. I came back to see him for the follow up the next morning, and I could yeah. see like he's got the scope down my my throat looking at the cords and I could see this huge big screen TV um, in front of me that has the the cool. laryngoscopy uh, image on it and I was looking at yeah. the cords and I knew what they should look like post surgery and it like didn't look right and I was like yeah. and I, I couldn't ask him I couldn't talk for 30 days right that was part right. of the recovery like you literally cannot talk that, no whispering that's crazy right there right no whispering got an instant monk yeah. mode right so um <laughs> And uh, I, I wrote it out on a pad and asked him, like, did the surgery go okay? And that's when he broke the news. And he said, yeah, surgery, surgery was fine. Um, but I, I was not able to safely remove the, the damaged tissue without risking further injury. Oh, okay. And that's his responsibility. He shouldn't, right? I wouldn't have wanted him to right. if I had been conscious to ask him, right? Yeah. So yeah, do no harm. the end result is now I've got 30 days ahead of me of, of basically being in my own little world of not being able to communicate freely with the outside world. I can, I had a little app on my phone so I could type and then it would talk for me. And I had a pad with me at all times so I could write down and, and ask for stuff. Right. That'd be um, interesting. Yeah. That was an interesting exp experience, but I like, <laughs> I was, couldn't work as well. So like I had a lot of time to myself. Um, and, uh, and kind of, that was the point. I was like, all right, what do I want to do next? Like what, yeah. what makes me happy? I was like, I don't well, think that, that point, I can imagine like, my life. At that point, was it just super clear? Like singing's not going to be a thing. Singing now, singing couldn't be an option. I mean, yeah. could I be a folk singer? Uh, maybe I don't know. It just it doesn't really. It doesn't. It doesn't appeal to me, right? Like opera is such as a. It, it maybe it's because of the athletic background. Like uh, opera is like part art and it's part athleticism as well. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, sure. And so, and uh, yeah, it was very clear that singing was not going to be a part of the future. So at that point, I was like, all right, I I'm in a really unique position. Like I can create this next thing. Yeah, I can just kind of go along with with my path that I've that I've been very fortunate on um, people just have been like throwing me opportunities in the restaurant world so um, and I realized I was like I, I want food to be a part of it but I also want fitness and health to be a part of, of it as well so and that's that was the genesis of, of the thought process and actually when I couldn't speak I wasn't actively training anybody at that point um, outside of a couple of friends like I would give them advice if they asked for stuff right but it was never like, not a structured training thing but I had uh, a friend reach out to me when I was still couldn't talk a couple weeks after the surgery. Yeah. Like, hey, dude, like you're always in such sick condition. Can you can you help me get in good condition? I want like someone to work with me. I was like, yeah, why not? Let's do it. And I was like, you know, it's like I don't really believe in the in the universe telling you what to do, sort of thing. But sure, when you have something like that happen, which seems like a really big coincidence. Yeah, when you take advantage of opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And and. I'd already decided by the time that text message came to me that I that I wanted to walk that path. I just didn't know what sure. it would look like yet, right? Yeah, I mean, so yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, what you know, when you started the whole thing with Grid Gym, I mean, like, I'm sure it looks different now than when you went into it. Like, you know, what am I going to get into here, right? Yeah, I mean, you just you you grow to become the person that you wanted to be, right? Yeah, exactly. And then situations change along the way too, and like you you adapt as you go. Um, 
Yeah, so that's that was the the cornerstone for it. And I was like, all right, what? Where's my unique skill set? What do I have that other people don't have and that, that they might need? Right? Mm -hmm. I was like, all right, I can cook amazing food. I know I know more about food than any healthy person should ever know about food. It's ludicrous, sure. right? I mean, like, yeah. and some of it's obsession based, and some of it's you know technique based, whatever. So. I don't, um, I, obsession is a positive thing. I, I know it gets tossed around as like people are like, you're obsessive, like it's bad. It's like, yeah, right. Everything yeah. that's ever come that, to me that is good is because I am a nut. Like I'm crazy, like, like for sure. I'm, I'm crazy obsessive. So like I look at it and I'm like, obsession is a gift. Yeah, yeah. no, it's true. And, and you can make a great argument that that every every human event that moved the, the yep. needle forward sort of technologically or culturally, like it was from some obsessive yeah. individual that like yep. did that for us. So yeah, nobody just fell into it. Like they were, yeah. they, were they, they, they obsessively pursued the thing that they wanted that, you know, for sure. they thought that they could provide whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. But. And then, and then for me, I realized that whenever I went off the wagon, um, with my own fitness and diet, it was two cravings, right? It wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, I'm hungry. I need something in my right. belly. Well, go get a bowl of brown rice. Yeah. I don't know. Like, Nobody's you know, starving. <laughs> like, exactly. Exactly. When, when homeless people are, are overweight, like nobody's starving, you know? Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, but like, all right, it was, it was craving based. Like sometimes you just crave something. Like I just want like macaroni and cheese. Yep. I, I know there's like barely, barely any nutritive value, but I want macaroni and cheese. Right. Yep. So, excuse me. And, um, I was like, well, I mean, let's just let's just make this like a, a game. Let's just say, all right, how can I make something that that hits all the the flavor, texture, mm -hmm. smell, visual triggers for macaroni and cheese? But maybe, in, dude, I, when I started looking up calories for stuff, and I, I think I know a lot about food and, and calories and stuff, and I would get on the websites of these these you know lower level uh, chain restaurants that I've been to with friends, and like, okay, I remember seeing they have the macaroni and cheese it was okay, it wasn't great. It was like a little dish like this big, dude, and it's like twelve hundred fifty calories. I'm like, how? That's like a science experiment. I don't even know how I would get 1,250 calories in that dish. Yeah. I like just put a stick of butter in and call it a day. But I mean, right. you know what I mean? And start looking at like what, what we eat habitually. Like, okay, certainly I can make that same macaroni and cheese for 600. It turns out I can make it for 250 or 300 calories and still have it taste pretty good. Yeah. Um, and that's part of, the, part of the equation. Like, you know, as well as I do, calories are not the only part of the equation, but they're a huge part of it, right? Oh, yeah. You can't um, discount the calorie. Like, um, yeah. <laughs> exactly. You can't just be like never count. Uh, like I don't. I don't think any. Most people don't need to count calories, but at the same time, they're they're a unit of measure that we should respect. Exactly. You know? And and I I agree with that wholeheartedly. That like at the end of the day, that's why all those silly things about like the Twinkie diet and the McDonald's <laughs> diet. Like yeah, if you if you're the, taking the in less diet is is one of my yeah. favorites I ever heard. They're like, why I did I lose twelve ones. pounds on the peanut butter cup diet? I'm like. Uh, well, it, there's good reasons for that. <laughs> uh, exactly. Why did you try it in the first place? Yeah. All, all you ate was peanut butter cups for like two weeks. But yeah. Yeah. And that, and that's the thing. Like, so if you can scratch your itch, uh, for that, that tempting food, that temptation trigger food for, as long as it just doesn't send you off the rails. Like I have an issue with right. sugar. I'll be perfectly honest with that. I have a wicked sweet tooth. Yeah. And if I go off the rails, Sometimes it's by choice, like, all right, I'm just going to let loose today and I get it. But like when I see the addictive pattern, like come into my own behavior, it's around sugar. Like, yeah. and, and we, we know that it hits the same pleasure centers in the brain that, that heroin does, right? Yeah. To a much, much, still, much you, less degree. You still have to confront it, you know, like, like it, totally. like that's the thing, like addiction doesn't mean impossible. I think like some people look at it like that. They're like, well, I'm addicted. There's nothing I can do. It's like bullshit. Yes, you can. Right. Yeah, yeah. for sure, man. Um, yeah, and that's well. That's kind of where the the genesis of that whole concept came. So that's that's what I'm working on right now. I'm putting together the the beta course right now. Awesome. I'm looking to get about a hundred people in there, and then like have those people, as silly as it sounds, like have them help me co-create the program. Because sometimes you get so much so much depth of expertise in right. in an in an area. Sometimes I don't know what the other person doesn't know because it seems right. like like what I don't I don't well, how do you I not know that, that like time. like constantly yeah, Right, because you like you learned that 15 years ago. It's buried so far down in the subsystems yeah. in your thought process yeah. that like I had this happen with with a training client, and I was trying to work with her, and she's like, "What's a macronutrient?" I was like, "What do you mean, what's a macronutrient?" Yeah, exactly. Like, I'm like, I do that. Uh, like, I'll say scapula, and people are like, "What's a scapula?" And I'm like, "Like that's to me, that's like saying like you don't know what your forehead is." You know, it's like, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, 
How do I? You had to do the sat around and read, read Grey's Anatomy in in high school like me, right? So like, do you ever do you go through the old anatomy textbooks when you're oh, younger? Oh yeah, totally. Um, I like I, I've read so many of these books that uh, read like stereo instructions that I don't. Know. Yeah, like uh, functional anatomy is one of those things. that's like for people who geek out on that kind of stuff, it's pretty hilarious. Like, right? Yeah, and you start <laughs> like, like talking about all the minor minor muscles in the forearm and hand, and like, why do you know that? Like, you don't need to know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, is at some point I almost look at myself and I'm just like, you've got to calm down. Like, like this is just yeah. Too yeah, but. yeah. Like you said, obsession obsession is is when it's directed in a positive way, is mm -hmm. is a good thing. Yeah. So totally, for sure. Um, I remember. So, I remember when we were talking. Remember when we were talking in Boise? You were you were a, right. a fan of of, and you were actually talking to someone else and indirectly. But I remember picking up a couple of things that like, um, and I know your stance is a little bit like anti diet, right? So, but yeah. you had mentioned like, dude, it's a, it's a bar. Why would you eat a bar if you can eat real food? Like sometimes you have to have a bar if you, there's no other option, and it it sure. can it can fill the gap. But like I know that you definitely kind of favor real food over you know yeah. the the food type stuff. Yeah. Um, but I'm also my my other project that I'm kind of stoked about right now, and again because I have this wicked sweet tooth, is I'm working on a uh, an all purpose uh, protein baking mix. So like there are a lot of protein pancake mixes out on the market, and like everyone at at at, uh, at my circle of uh, friends are like, oh the Kodiak cakes, Kodiak cakes, and I got all stoked about Kodiak cakes, and I went and saw it at the store. They were doing a, a like a a little demonstration at Costco, and I was there picking up some stuff. I was like oh cool Kodiak cakes, I was like. Uh, they're okay. They're they're not great. Whatever. And I looked at the box and I was like, "This is a protein pancake, right?" And I looked at the protein. I looked at the macros. I looked at the ingredients. It's like, dude, this is like when when Oreos sold a high protein Oreo, and like there was barely any protein in it. They like threw like a a, a, a sprinkle pixie dust sprinkle of of whey protein in the recipe and called it a protein Oreo or a protein uh, Cheerio. It's like um, the vegan protein bars that are like six grams of protein and. Right, like thirty and, and grams some of, of them, sugar, and it's like, wait a minute here. And some of them actually tout the stats, but they're they're touting it to a relatively ignorant uh, uh, crowd. They're like, as much protein as an egg. Well, everybody knows that eggs have protein, right? Yeah, well, an egg has six grams of protein, right? So, like, as much protein as an egg is not a selling point to someone who actually knows something about like right. how much I might need to get in in the course of a day to support my my strength training, right? Yeah. So it's just, it's just, yeah, the the mis the misleadings of marketing, right? Like, uh, you definitely don't want to uh, use that as like, like you want to look at them as selling points, not as a uh, right, like factual like information that you slug in your head that that you use to uh, to to like navigate your health choices. Yeah, you know, for like, sure, <laughs> for sure. You can get yourself wrapped up in some silly stuff there. Absolutely. Um, and again, so scratching my own itch, I was like, all right, I wanted like, um, I'd seen like some of the stuff, some of the recipes that Quest Protein uh, had done on their blog and stuff. And the stuff always looks good, but like it rarely tasted really amazing to me. Sure. Um, yeah. But the, it, was, it was cool because they were, they were really trying to serve the market and give people like me who have a sweet tooth, something that could feel and taste like dessert a little bit yep. and not go completely off the rails, right? Right. Um, and, uh, and so that's when I started playing with the protein pancake mix. But then I was like, okay, so I've, I'm making pretty good protein. Uh, yeah. Pancakes, and I was like, okay, I'm making pretty good waffles. I was like, ah, oh, what else can I do with this stuff? So I made like a savory version and a sweet version. Oh, cool! Um, nice. And uh, so the savory version, I was making like little flatbreads and crepes, and uh, I even made a uh, like something that like served like sandwich bread. It was not that great. That was the one that I was like, meh. Everything else <laughs> was pretty awesome. You know what I mean? But sure. I was like, um, yeah, I was making all kinds of cool stuff. Um, one thing we didn't t uh, talk about. Sorry to backtrack for one second. Sure. Um, as, as a kind of a belief breaking uh, experiment for me, because a lot of people, when I, would, when I would try to explain to them what I was working on, I was like so excited about it. I was like, dude, you can't, They're like, there's no way you can eat pizza and burgers and macaroni and cheese and get in good shape. And you and I just had the conversation about, yeah, if you watch your calorie balance, you absolutely can, right? right? And like, hopefully, you, you can get enough micronutrient in there yeah. so you don't end up sick of the difference between the one piece and a whole pizza. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And so I, was, I, I looked at it, I was like, all right. Let's do let's do a a challenge for myself. I said, and originally it was supposed to be four weeks. It ended up being seven weeks, just okay. because that's what I needed to get in really top shape. Um, and I also didn't want to do it like in a totally like 
robot mode I, where I had a couple of important <laughs> celebrations. I was like, all right, I'm going to take a night off, right? Celebrate this person's birthday properly. I'm not going to sure. go off the rails, but I'm You're not, not going like, to sit. I can't eat that cake. Uh, right, sorry. exactly. I didn't. Yeah. I, you know, I've been there so many times. I've been there so many times. I didn't want to do that anymore, right? So I made that part of the rules for me. Like, all right, if there's something I need to enjoy, I'm going to enjoy it. Right. Um, but it took me seven weeks. But I, I did a, a little ask campaign through a few different um, uh, avenues, yeah. and uh, and I said, okay, so what are your top three favorite cheat foods? If mm -hmm. you were on a diet or you're eating healthy and you had a free day or a free meal, something you okay. felt you couldn't have when you were being healthy, what would be your top three cheat foods? And it was really interesting. It was really instructive. What did you find? And I, I, oh, well, it was a lot of the stuff that a lot of the stuff that you would expect from Americans, right? So it was like burgers, um, uh, pizza, macaroni and cheese, ice cream. But I, I kind of combined a couple of things. I heard a lot of different things in, in like typical Mexican fast food, Mexican type stuff. So tacos and burritos, okay. I kind of put in one thing together. Uh, yeah, um, that makes sense. They're basically right, milkshakes, just a different yeah, brand. basically you know different shapes of of the same awesome stuff, right? Yeah, and uh, and you know, so I kind of lumped milkshakes and ice cream together because I heard a lot of those answers together. Yeah. Um, and uh, but the thing that was funny is that depending if the person was like indoctrinated in the keto lifestyle or they were indoctrinated in the low fat lifestyle mm -hmm. they're like oh i want to have a steak like why couldn't you have a steak like just choose the right cut and you're gonna have steak all day long yeah. right you can't have a ribeye and eat the fat gristle off the stuff that's not a good idea right it's delicious but you know um you know and then the other person's like oh i'd want to have rice i was like why can't you have rice I like, yeah. well, i know rice isn't healthy i was like okay cool i mean like <laughs> like but so it was it was things things that are just like kind of out there where like if you're full right, blown but, keto and you're just like like you want rice and you're full blown vegan and you want a steak and you're full blown paleo and you want some ice cream, it's just like oh man, like totally. I, I guess the, that, you know it's providing structure to the person, but at the same time, like uh, well, the thing, they lose the me. Thing, exactly, and the thing the thing that um, the thing that got me was that it was the absolute certainty with which the person responded. And it was always like, oh, I know the potatoes. Oh, are healthy. yeah, totally. You know what yeah. I mean? I know. And so for them, it was a yeah. decided fact. And they're they're going to change it two years from now or six months from now. They're going to they're going to find something else, and they're going right. to and they're going to like, I know that butter is not yeah. healthy, or I it's know that whatever. Either so, preconceived notion. Yeah, they can't like salt. Salt was that way like fifteen years ago. It was like yeah, totally. Like, you can't use you can't use salt on things. It'll kill you. It's like right. Like, why? <laughs> like salt keeps you alive. Right. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I agree a hundred percent. But so I, so I did the seven week challenge and I said, all right, not only like, and I, it sounded like a great idea at the time. It was a horrible idea from a lifestyle <laughs> perspective, right? I said, I said, okay. I said, every meal for every day for the entire time, I have to eat one of these 10 foods, right? Which well, sounds okay. awesome for the first three days. Burgers, pancakes, cake, um, milkshake, ice cream. Yeah. Uh, had to have something of those things. But my challenge was like, okay, if I'm gonna have a milkshake, how do I make it a healthy version of a milkshake, right? Mm -hmm. So you can see one of the photos that I posted on my Instagram account, which is only like a couple dozen posts on there. It's not like I've been super active, but I did put a lot of the pictures of dishes I had during that time period was like a mint chocolate chip protein milkshake. It was delicious. Yeah. And you know, I'm also, I'm not gonna be uh, cute about it. Was I busting my ass to like burn calories and build yeah. muscle and stuff? Yeah, I, was, right. I was busting my ass every day in the gym. Yeah. So it's not like I wasn't working. It wasn't the Shangri-La, I eat milkshakes and I yeah. get jacked, sort of like fantasy, right? I was doing the work behind it and I was watching my calorie balance and I was tracking all my macros and stuff. So I was dialed in really, really tight. But, you know, I was doing a pretty traditional uh, thing for me. I was eating five or six times per day. So five or six times okay. per day, I wasn't in a position where I was able to get food out very often, right? Because the whole thing was like, how can I make the food be, to, be healthy, right? Yeah. So I was cooking so much. I was I was cooking like six six meals like per day, right? Job. Yeah, yeah. Like, but if I'm not doing that that constraint of like this has to be a burger or a pizza or whatever, I mean, like, dude, I like having a little like bowl of like cream of rice with some protein powder mixed in and some yeah. nut butter or some nuts on top. That's totally satisfying to me. If you put enough flavor in it, it's actually pretty enjoyable to eat. There's not I don't yeah. feel. And, it, you and if you take the the discipline to be super present with the food, yeah. dude, I totally agree that the research is coming out on mindful eating and conscious yeah. uh, eating is insane. And like stuff I would have never, never uh, assumed, right? Yep. Um, and it's yeah, because if you, you eat on the go, you just shut, or like you eat in front of a screen, or you eat yep. in your car. You know, like you're you're just you're just putting the stuff. In, you you never actually feel satisfied because you never actually experienced the the, exactly. the food. 
it, and so just like if you're going to keep reaching for stuff, you're you're never going to have that satisfaction. Yeah. For sure. And and if you look at if you look at the research they've done around uh, mindful eating, it's almost like on a certain level, like yeah, your body took in the calories, it took in the nutrients, it processed it, it digested it, but is it psychological? Only on a biological is, level. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's something about it. Like it's almost like it didn't register. You yeah. know, they always say that like. Uh, beverage calories are not registered by the body in a hunger signal way the same way that solid foods are on the whole, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why these strongman competitors who have to get 10,000 calories in a day are like doing liquid stuff as well because they don't right. feel as, as full. Yeah. It's the same, seems to be the same thing with mindful eating. If you're eating mm -hmm. distracted in front of TV, in front of social yeah. media, it's almost like your body didn't fully register that you had that food. And you certainly yeah. didn't enjoy it the same way. Yeah, especially like when you add in like high fructose corn syrup doesn't have the same uh, hormonal response. Like we don't like our hunger hormones yep. don't just necessarily just like say, Hey, you just ate, um, in, in reference to those, the, to that, like they're all chemicals on some level, but to that, to that chemical that's going in your body doesn't register the same as, you know, like yep. all the combined factors. And then you add mindless eating on top of it. And then all of a sudden you're putting in way more, you, you're constantly never feeling satisfied. You never have that pleasure yep. from the food. And it's uh, like sure. talking about a bummer. <laughs> like, yeah, I want to get pleasure from the food that I eat. You know, I, I want it to be an experience. Uh, our re our relationship with, with food is so complex, and yeah. and especially for someone like me who's had issues with their their weight in the past, and also like with overeating. Like, I'll be perfectly right. honest. Like, I I have been in the past a very big overeater, right? Even yeah. with healthy food, you can still get fat on healthy food if you eat yeah. enough of it, right? It's Not just even hard. That hard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, depending um, on who you are, it's not that hard for me anyway. Like, like I can put down a shitload of food. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I call it one of the things I always laugh about, like for me, is I call it the last cookie syndrome. And this is, goes back to distracted eating, right? Yeah. So you got a bag of cookies and you're eating the cookies and you grab the last one. You don't realize it's the last one. You ate it and you reach in for another and it's not there. You're like, it's such, ah, such a I didn't get to eat the last. And you're like, dude, it was either way with the last cookie. You just didn't know it and to savor it as the last cookie as such when you had it. And, that, and like, you have a little disconnect. It's like, I didn't get to have the last cookie. Well, yeah, you did either way. You right. just didn't enjoy it, yeah. right? It's the, you do so like, the same thing with like French fries. Like uh, you get a whole plate of French fries and you're like, you think you have to eat all the French fries. So you're like tripling up the French fries. <laughs> yeah. and, and really it's just like, why don't you just eat them one at a time, get the same, you know, and then stop. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, when you're done with the French fries. But because it's on the plate, you you think you have to eat it, you know, and then totally. you have to be mindless to get there. And then you go back to like to to portion size uh, and like you know because I've I've worked with a lot of people from from other um, countries around the world like mm -hmm. it's always a running joke about how big the portion sizes are in America and it's yeah. true like it, it just is yeah um and and going back to restaurants for a second and not because I like, I love the restaurant world sure um people don't understand like unless it's literally like there are several really good restaurants here in town that are like greens and protein. And, is one of the ones sure. here and they, and they they list macros and pro and calories for everything and, and their job is to to give you healthy food that you know what you're consuming mm -hmm. outside of that one little micro niche which is tiny in the restaurant world yeah. the restaurant's yeah. job is not to give you healthy food the restaurant's job yeah. is to give you something so freaking tasty and addictive that you're snapchatting or instagramming the photo of the food and bragging your friends about how that you had it and then jonesing for like next time i go to vegas i'm gonna go and have that, that restaurant again yeah. or that dish or whatever, yeah. right? That's their job is to give you yeah. something so over the top that you want to come back and have it. Yeah, and they can and only do that in so many ways, right? They have to add sugar, salt, or fat. You know, like like. Oh my God! Yeah, and yeah. fat's the one thing. Fat's the one thing you can't see in a dish, right? Yeah. Um, it, it, like you can have a, a dish of risotto that's roughly the same volume, and one is and like because traditional Italian risotto doesn't have a lot of fat in it. They, they you know, the outside of the starch grain breaks down and gives it that creamy consistency. Now, a French chef's a version of risotto is going to be lo loaded with butter and usually a little yeah. bit of cream as well, right? They I like, look about I, the same. I like, that. I like how the French do things. I really yeah. like how the French, uh, like the French, how they attack, uh, they, their uh, culture around food just in general, but Absolutely. there's a lot of, to unpack just in that statement. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, I. it's funny when you overhear people, what they choose to eat and why they choose to eat it, you know what I mean? But, but uh, going back to the big plate of French fries, um, the restaurant also has to give perceived value, right? Yeah. So French fries don't cost anything to produce, yeah, so right? They can up. So they can give you this enormous bucket of fries that doesn't make any sense unless you're yep. sharing it with two other people, right? Yeah. But again, like like I grew up in, in relatively frugal um, circumstances. We weren't like dirt poor, but like, mm -hmm. you know, money was an issue for my parents for a long time. And yeah. so I hate wasting food. I hate wasting yeah, food. Yeah, I do too. Right? I'm saying, 
Exact same. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and uh, so that, of course, will sabotage your your process unless you feel like bagging up some French fries and going back to them later, which is you know, <laughs> disgusting the next day, right? Which is just this, yeah. And it's just like calories now and calories later. Like it's still <laughs> right. Exactly. It's still the same volume. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's kind of funny. I, I want to do some writing about restaurants, but I want to be careful about it because I, I don't want it to be this like throwing yeah, you don't want to the restaurant them. industry. Yeah, because I, mean, yeah. like, I, I love that world. I'm part of that world and and I respect it. There's a lot of um and there's, and there's nothing wrong with them trying to create perceived value. You know, like right. like grocery stores do the same thing. Everything in a grocery store is designed to get you to buy something. And why totally. shouldn't they? You know, like that's their right. business. Like they should do that's, that. But exactly. um, like hopefully they do it in a sense of service to the to the customer, but but the customer also right. needs to be, have have some you know enough uh, savvy or, or or conscious thought while they're walking through it that you know do I need this? Do I not need this? You know, um, a little For presence sure. of mind goes a long way in both of those For scenarios. Sure. But yeah, um, yeah, man. Well, I I don't know what kind of food uh, you guys really like, but at some point in the future, we should do some collaboration of like totally. How do you guys give me some uh, a couple of recipes that stuff that because I ask people to do this and they misunderstand the the exercise. I think you understand it innately from our conversation. Sure. I'll say, hey, send me a recipe of something that 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 you really want to eat, and I'll make a healthier version of it. And they'll send me like a healthy recipe from like yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah that's what, it looks <laughs> horrible. That's like my job is to make that. it healthier, right? Right. Like something yeah. that you will actually want to eat because you, it looks awesome and delicious, right? Yeah. So I'm gonna send you like a hot pocket. Exactly right. I mean, I don't know. We can probably make a hot pocket, right? Nah, I'm, just, I'm joking around. I just was. It's it's always funny when, when people want to come in and, and they like try to impress you, and they're like, "Well, I only eat the lean hot pocket," and it's like, "Okay, <laughs> great." <laughs> like, um, I'm not gonna lie. Whatever. Right. I'm not yeah. gonna lie. I've had my fair share of hot pockets, but I think they're in that like 16 to eight year, 18 year old category, right? So yeah, it's been a, I, it's been a I, while. I think I was in single digits, or or maybe I don't know. I was a, exactly. Like, I was at least a kid when I was eating hot pockets. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, back when back when you you probably shouldn't be, you know, starting an oven, you know. You right? Like, yeah. yeah. Um yeah, no, that would be cool. I'd I'd love to do that. I'd have to I'd have to think on that. Like some like our, I'd have to give you some really tough ones cuz I'd want to like pick out my like least healthy things that I like to eat and then send them to you and and gamify right. it. Up. That'd be cool. Yeah. And it's and it's funny because like you know I'll say virtually any food because I'm sure there are foods like braised pork belly well unless you use a different cut it's going to be pretty much the same thing right you yeah. can't like you can't use the magic wand and make it something it's not but right. you know um, I made yeah, some uh, a brisket's made, all, always going to be pretty fatty you know like, like there's certain exactly but yeah. exactly but but one of the things you can do is like you can choose a different cut that has less fat. And do a braise on it, and if you do it the right way, one of the tricks I like to do is is add some gelatin back in the dish because if you okay. part of what you from like fatty braising cuts generally have a lot of connective tissue as well, right? So when you yeah. slow cook that, connective tissue breaks down and gives you like yeah, that makes that a lot of sense. sense. Gloopy sort of texture yeah. when you're doing like a, especially with like a taco filling or something, right? Well, if you take <laughs> um, you take a little bit of uh, of just powdered uh, beef gelatin, yeah. dissolve it in some water or a little bit of the sauce throw it back in the pot and let that incorporate. And like, it gives it a certain amount of mouthfeel. Like part of that thing that you're missing from the richer cut comes back in, but like gelatin, like costs you virtually no calories. It's just, it's just neutral protein. Right. right. So yeah, well let's, let's work on a couple of dishes. That'd be fun. I will. Experiment. Yeah. I'll send you some as soon as I think of them. I, I do need to get going though. Uh, I got a client yeah, in, in like, well, 27 minutes. So, um, but, uh, I got to drive there too. So, yeah. um, <laughs> But no, this has been awesome, man. Thanks for doing this. Um, is there any other like kind of words of wisdom that you want to get across before we jet off? I don't know about. I don't know if I'm the guy for words for wisdom. But, you know, it's bomb on everybody. Right, exactly. No, I, I think I think like my big my big platform is trying to convince people that 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 fitness, like having an awesome body and eating awesome food, is not an either or equation. But that's yeah. how we've been trained. Couldn't Society. agree more. Either could not either agree. You have more. an amazing physique. Either you have an amazing physique and you're strong and you're healthy and you are super disciplined and you never eat anything bad or it's a once a week cheat meal, right? Yeah. Or, or you can have an awesome uh, lifestyle and eat a lot of tasty foods and go, and go like culinary adventuring. Like, dude, you can do both of those right. if you approach them the right way. Like, yeah. you, can you go out to like the amazing restaurant every night of the week for a year? Probably not. It's not a good mm -hmm. idea. 
right? Yeah. But you can like once once or twice a week go like have an amazing meal and like right. just watch your stuff the other the other days, right? Yep. So yeah, that's, that's what I would say. Just like don't don't it. Don't accept, don't accept that lie. Don't accept the fact that, that like you can either be fit or you can have awesome food. You can do both those things. Yeah. yeah Cause it just becomes a scapegoat so easy where it's just like, well, I guess I'll never be able to do that because I don't want to live like, you know, it's like, no, you don't, you, you, it doesn't mean it's, it's not an either or it can be yeah. a both. Yeah, for sure. Totally. Absolutely. But, um, and then where can people follow you? So, uh, under my name, Elias Notus, uh, on Facebook, I have a public, uh, public figure page there that I'm going to start. Uh, documenting my my transition this year is, is all about going off of counting calories and macros yeah. and just kind of like living, I don't want to say instinctually because instinctually my body wants to be like 300 plus pounds. That's <laughs> what I've found, right? Yeah. But eating more, eating more like freestyle, right? And just yeah. kind of enjoying it's it and like taking it as it comes. Eating. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and you can find me there. And then also my Instagram account is uh, Flavor Hacker Fitness. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that's yeah, awesome. Well, I appreciate it. This has been really fun. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for doing it. Um, I got to get running right after this, but uh, but I'll here in about an hour. I'll come back on and and type some stuff up and get back to you. Send it. Awesome. To you. Right. Awesome. I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for being here, Elias. Yeah. All right. Take All care, right, man. guys. Please like, comment, share, and we'll see you next time. All right. See ya.